Hi, hello. Yeah. Also, pleasure to have uh, Yuan Zhang here to give the presentation on his recent work, Joint Model for Dependency Parsing. And Yuan Zhang is a computer science PhD candidate at MIT, working with Professor Regina Ambadale. He earned the bachelor degrees in computer science from Tsinghua University. His research interest lies in the intersection of natural language processing and machine learning. And much of his work has been focused on algorithms and the synthetic parsing and transfer language. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, is the voice OK here? OK, cool. OK, thank you. Thank you for coming to the talk. Today I'm going to talk about my research work on joint modeling uh, techniques for dependency parsing. And this talk is based on the joint work with my advisor, Regina Basile, and also the following collaborators, including Tommy Akola, Tao Lei, and David Weiss. Yeah, so this talk is going to be about 15 minutes, so feel free to stop me if you have any questions. OK. So the dependency parsing problem has been started for more than 10 years. The goal of dependency parsing is to automatically extract dependency relations in a sentence. So if we give a sentence to a parser, it will automatically generate a dependency tree of this sentence like this. Usually, we just give the raw sentence to the parser. However, most of the parsers have to also rely on part speech text to generate uh, useful features for parsing. So how do they obtain the part speech text for the input sentence? A simple solution here is to use the pipeline method. That is, they first train an independent part speech tagger and then use it to predict the text for the sentence as a pre-processing step. Moreover, if we want to parse a Chinese sentence, we first need to do word segmentation as another pre-processing step, because Chinese doesn't naturally have word boundaries. So this pipeline framework is a common choice for most of the parsers. However, an important issue when using this method is error propagation. Like here, the errors in word segmentation will cause more errors in part speech tagging and even more errors in dependency parsing. So the goal of our work is to use the idea of joint modeling to address this error propagation problem. Let's look at a more concrete example to motivate joint modeling method. So in this example, he slowly closed the windows. The word closed should be a verb. However, it's very difficult for a window-based part of speech tagger to predict it correctly. Because given the context slowly closed windows, the word closed can be either a verb or an adjective. So if the, if the tagger predicted as an adjective, it's very likely that the parser will also make mistakes. Because the adjective is usually the modifier of a noun rather than the root of the sentence. So in joint modeling, however, if we predict text and trees at the same time, it's easy to see that the first configuration is much better than the second one. So the joint model will not make the same mistakes as in the pipeline model, and it can correct both the parsing and tagging errors. Let's look at another example on Arabic dependency parsing. On this data set, the parse speech tagging accuracy is about 96%. However, there's up to an 8% passing performance difference between using the gold information and using a pipeline model with predicted information. The green bar here shows the example results of our joint modeling method on the same Arabic data set. It's exciting to see that we improved the passing accuracy to 87%, which cuts the performance gap by more than 50%. Gold means using the gold part speech. So the, uh, you have the manually annotated part speech text for the input sentence that is called the gold uh, part speech text here. So it's 100% accuracy. While the pipeline model here used an independent part speech tagger first predict the text. So it's about like 96% tagging accuracy. So some of the texts are wrong in this case. Do you have any idea the tagging accuracy on the joint model? Um, so for this joint model, it's a, it's a, in the later slides I will show, so it's about 97, between 97 to 98 percent. So you also improve the part of speech accuracy by about one, between one to two percent. Okay. So we can see that uh, joint modeling can effectively reduce error propagation in the uh, pipeline model. Then why are we still using pipeline? 
The main reason here is that using joint modeling will inevitably increase the complexity of the inference task, such as the time complexity and the search space. So it's not trivial to apply joint modeling in every scenario. Actually, there's always a trade-off between the, the inference complexity and the complexity of the parsing model. For instance, in first-order parsing, we can find the optimal solution in polynomial time, while the second-order parsing is already NP-hard. However, the inference in joint modeling is even much harder. This is because the search space for second-order parsing is still the tree space, but for the joint modeling, the search space is a combination of the tree and tag space, which is more complex and which is much larger and more complex than the tree space. So in the rest part of the talk, I'm going to introduce two of our work to address this challenge. And they both have unique advantages for solving joint modeling problem. Let's first look at the randomized greedy approach for joint segmentation, tagging, and parsing. The key advantage of this method is that we have no constraint on the scoring function, while previous work usually needs some kinds of constraint to keep the inference tractable. I'm also going to show that this method is very simple, but also very effective. Can you give me some example of the constraints? Uh, so the constraints, uh, for instance, in, like in dual decomposition, they need the scoring function uh, to be uh, can be factorized into some small parts, like third order parsing relate is based on three arcs, second order parsing is based on two arcs, and you need to combine them together. And in like transition based parsing, uh, the features have to be defined based on the uh, partially constructed tree. So if like part of the sentence is still not constructed yet, you cannot define features on that part. While in the later part, I will show that our method always operate on a full tree structure. So if you want to compute the tree score, you don't have any constraints. So you can define arbitrary features based on this tree structure. So that is the key idea here. OK. So the randomized greedy algorithm in this approach is actually from our earlier dependency parsing system. So instead of directly jumping into the uh, joint modeling problem, I will first introduce this algorithm in the context of dependency parsing, and then explain how to extend it to the joint inference problem. So the key idea is very simple. We first, greedily, we first use greedy hill climbing to find local optimal trees. And second, we overcome the local optimal problem using random restart. And that's it. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you more details for each step. Let's first look at greedy hill climbing. So the key idea is to greedily improve the tree by changing one edge at a time. So we keep going over each word in the sentence and pick the new head that has the highest score. So here is the example. We want to find the new head for the word end. First, the scores of choosing dogs or cats as the new head are negative infinity. This is because it will form a loop and break the tree structure. So we should never choose them as the new head. However, we could choose the root as the new head and compute the score of the new tree. Assume that the score is zero in this case. Similarly, we can choose i or like as the new head and compute the corresponding tree score. So among all these three options, we will choose like as the new head because it gives the highest score. And this completes one step of hill climbing. This yeah. head the score of the whole tree. Whole tree. Yeah. So now you see, you can see you have the whole tree, so you can compute uh, the whole feature, the score for the for all the features here. So if you pick the head, mm -hmm. which leads to a invalid tree. Yeah. So that is this case, right? So if it's not a valid tree, then we we will force the scores to be negative infinity here. So which means we should never choose them. We don't consider them as the candidate head. We will check more than one hop. For example, the dog and the head is easy because you have a yeah. bad point. But how about maybe you like have another indirect point to end? Uh, so you mean the, the size of the cycle is larger than one? Yeah. Yeah. So right. So we also check that. We need to make sure that every so it's always a valid tree. You don't have any si any cycle in the tree. 
be a big limitation because sometimes you need to change two edges at the same time. Then right. You right. So actually, this method will only uh, stop in a local optimal, and sometimes this local optimal can be like bad because of the you know two jump limitations that you just mentioned. And in the next slides, I'm gonna show how we use random restarts to overcome this problem. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, there are one more slides for the greedy hill climbing. So we just keep updating the head of each node in the sentence in a bottom-up order and keep increasing the tree score until we reach a local optimal. So when I say the bottom-up order here, I mean we first update the head of the leaf nodes in the tree, and then their parents, and finally the root of the tree. So the main reason for this choice is that if we update in this bottom-up order, we can transform from any tree to any other tree while maintaining the valid tree structure at any point. So if we learn perfect parameters, uh, perfect parameter values, we can always end up with the global optimal solution. But of course, in practice, we never have these uh, perfect parameters, so it will get stuck in a local optimal. So another thing I want to mention here is that uh, we always operate on a valid tree structure during the update. So this means we don't need to have any, con any constraint on the scoring function in order to compute the tree score. So we can incorporate arbitrary global features in the scoring function. And that is one main advantage of this method. OK. So as I just mentioned, sometimes the greedy method can get stuck in a very poor local optimal. And our solution to overcome the local optimal problem is also very simple. We only need to do the random restart. So we can randomly generate uh, st new starting trees from certain distributions, such as a uniform distribution, and run the hill climbing algorithm, and finally just pick the best tree with the highest score. And in practice, we need no more than 100 random restarts to get a good passing performance. And yeah, in the next slides, I will explain why this happens. So that's all about the randomized greedy algorithm. Despite of its simplicity, we found this algorithm works incredibly well in dependency parsing. <coughs> First, it effectively utilized the global features and outperformed the previous state-of-the-art parser on the kernel data set. Second, in the first-order parsing, we found this algorithm returns the global optimal solution for almost all the sentences. So while this is a surprising result, our further analysis shows that this is not a coincidence because the number of local optimal in the search space is actually very small for most of the sentences. For instance, in English, the number is no more than 21 for 50% of the sentences. And this explains why the randomized greedy algorithm can work uh, for dependency parsing. So given the success of this algorithm on dependency parsing, a natural question here is whether it is still scalable for a more complex inference problem such as the one in joint prediction. OK. So to investigate into this question, we extend this algorithm to a joint prediction task. As I showed earlier, we found this algorithm also works pretty well on, uh, on this hard inference problem and significantly outperformed the pipeline model. Comparing to previous uh, joint modeling methods, our method has the following advantages. I have already mentioned the first one, which is we have no constraint on the scoring function. And the second, we show that it's easy, to it's easy to apply our model to different languages, such as Chinese and Arabic, without significant change. Finally, it's easy to parallelize our algorithm so we can achieve higher speed with more computing resources. OK, so next I'm going to show how we apply this randomized greedy idea to a joint prediction. The core idea is still the same. We climb in a few small greedy steps to find the optimal assignment for all three tasks, segmentation, tagging, and parsing. On the high level, we repeat hill climbing algorithm multiple times. And finally, we pick the best assignment with the highest score. For the hill climbing algorithm, uh, we first randomly sample not only a dependency tree, but also segmentation and parse speech tags. And it, then it greatly improves the parse speech text and the tree uh, by changing one value at a time and in an iterative fashion. Fin so it repeats the second step until reach a convergence. And next I'm going to uh, 
explain each step with more details. So I will first use Arabic as a running example, and later I will talk about how we apply the model to Chinese. So in the first step, uh, given the sentence, we, draw a, we randomly draw a sample of segmentation and post-speech text from the search space. So following common practice, we use the lattice structure to represent the search space, like here. Yeah, and later I'm going to explain how we construct this lattice structure. Uh, so here is the example sentence in Arabic, and we, we could draw the following segmentation and post speech tags, and they correspond to the red arcs in the lattice structure. So specifically, we sample from the first order distribution, which is proportional to the exponential of the feature score. So given the value of segmentation and post speech tags, next we randomly sample a dependency tree Y from the first order distribution using the Wilson algorithm. So the Wilson algorithm is able to incrementally construct the sample based on a random work procedure. So after sampling the initial configuration, uh, next the hill climbing algorithm alternates between improving the power speech text and improving the dependency tree via local uh, greedy changes. For power speech tagging, it uh, updates the tag of each segment also in the bottom of order. Uh, and the algorithm enumerates all, over all possible tags and pick the one that maximizes uh, maximize the full scoring function. So the complexity here is linear to the number of possible heads. Um, okay, so as in dependency parsing, here we have no constraint on this scoring function. So we can incorporate arbitrary features here to capture the interaction across different tasks. So after here climbing over the power speech text, um, next we improve the dependency tree via a similar hill climbing process. So we go over each segment also in the bottom of order and pick, uh, pick the new heads that maximize the same full scoring function here. Moreover, we only consider the candidate heads that, doesn't, that don't violate the tree structure here. So we repeat hill climbing over the power speech tags and the dependency tree until we reach a local optimal. And this completes one run of hill climbing. So sometimes we can get stuck in a very poor local optimal. And as in previous work, we also use the random restarts to solve this problem. Each time we generate a new random sample and run hill climbing algorithm and finally pick the best assignment that has the highest score. So one big advantage of this random restart is that we can do it in parallel uh, because each run is relatively cheap and is independent to others. So we can easily speed up the algorithm with more computing resources. Okay, so that's all about the randomized greedy algorithm. In this slide, I would like to briefly talk about two tricks to, for efficient feature extraction because extracting features is actually uh, the efficiency bottleneck of this algorithm. First, remember that in hill climbing, uh, we need to repeatedly compute the feature difference between two trees that differ in only one dependency. So in practice, we don't need to compute the features for the whole tree. Instead, we only need to com uh, compute the features of few dependencies. So for instance, for the first order features, we only need to compute the features for the different dependencies, that is the red arcs because all other features will cancel out. Second, we also catch the frequently used feature vectors into the memory, and uh, we also share this cache table across all the threads when we use multi-threading to parallelize the hill climbing. So in practice, these two optimizations are very useful and they improve the speed by more than one magnitude. Okay, so that's all about the inference algorithm. Next, I'm gonna uh, talk about how we learn the model. So we use the standard max margin framework for learning. Specifically, we, ser we search parameter values that score the gold assignment to be higher than the scores of other assignment by a non-trivial margin. Here we define the margin as the number of errors in segmentation, part speech tags, and dependencies when compared against uh, the gold values. So in order to solve this objective, we use the passive aggressive online learning framework. In this framework, the main challenge is to find the optimal solution for each sentence in every, iter in every iteration. 
And we use the same randomized greedy algorithm to solve this, uh, to solve this problem. OK, so to complete the description of the model, here I will explain how we generate the lattice structure. For Arabic, we use the model system to generate uh, candidate morphological analysis and uh, for each token in the sentence. For example, MARA predicts that the example word here has two possible segmentations. And for the first segmentation, there are two possible part speech tags. And we can combine this analysis into the following lattice structure, so, and they are equivalent to each other. OK, so far I have described our model in the context of Arabic. However, as I said, we can easily apply our model to Chinese. And the key difference actually lies in the construction of the lattice structure. So if the Chinese lattice structure is constructed, the joint prediction model can be applied without any additional change. So how do we construct the lattice for Chinese? So in our work, we use the Stanford word segmenter to generate the candidate word segmentation for each sentence. So here gives the example of two possible segmentations for the sentence. And then we combine this analysis into the, into the, following, uh, into the following lattice structure. And then we further generate the parse speech tags for parse speech candidates for each segment using a CRF based parse speech tagger. OK, so that's all about model. Now let's look at our experiment and result. We evaluate our model and all the baselines on three data sets. For Chinese, we use the Chinese Pantry Bank. And for Arabic, we use, uh, we, we use two data sets. First, we use modern standard Arabic data set, which is from the SPMRL 2013 shear task. And second, we use a mixed Arabic data set. The training data of this data set comes from Arabic Pantry Bank, which primarily includes the MSA text. However, we test on a new classical Arabic corpus, which is annotated by a native speaker. And this mixed data set is particularly interesting for joint model evaluation because, the, because classical Arabic uses a different vocabulary from MSA, but their syntactic, syntactic grammars are different to each other. So incorporating syntactic grammars here should be particularly beneficial for morphological uh, segmentation and parse speech tagging. So in our experiment, we use two evaluation metrics. First, we use F-score for segmentation, tagging, and parsing. And second, we use TED-EVL score for the SPMRL data set, which is a joint evaluation on the quality of segmentation and parsing. So the table here shows the average number of segmentation and parse speech tags in the lattice structure, as well as the average length of the sentence. We tune the pruning threshold to ensure about 99% oracle accuracy. And finally, there are about two to three part of speech tags in the lattice. So we can see that we do prune the search space quite a lot. However, note that there are still many sentences with more than 30 words in the corpus. So for those long sentences, uh, the joint inference is still much more challenging for the inference in the pipeline model, even after pruning the search space. So we compare our model against two state-of-the-art systems. For the SPMRL data set, we compare against the best performing system in the shear task, which is a pipeline system. And for the Chinese data set, we compare against the best reported number, which is uh, produced by a transition-based joint model. We also compare against the pipeline variant of our model. Uh, specifically, we predict post speech tags and segmentations using the same system, the same preprocess systems that we use to generate candidates in our joint model. And then we apply the standard dependency parsing on top of these predictions. OK. So in our model, we use feature templates that are standard in each individual task. However, after combining all those features into one scoring function, they effectively capture the interaction across different tasks. Um, for instance, consider the most basic feature in dependency parsing that relies on the head part speech and the modifier part speech. In, dependent, uh, in joint modeling, this basic feature also captures the interaction between part speech tagging and dependency parsing. OK. So the, in the first experiment, we compare our model against the best performing model, the best performing system on each data set. 
And here shows the results of the dependency F score. In both cases, our model outperforms the uh, state of the art systems, but the gains are more significant on the SPMRL data set because it, the baseline is a pipeline model. So on this data set, the, we improved the score by about 5%. Another thing I want to emphasize here is that both baselines are designed specifically for the target languages, while our model uh, provides a general framework which is applied to different languages without significant change. So for the, for the, uh, on the Chinese, Chinese benchmark, the baseline is for your learning work? Yeah, the baseline is the, it's also a, it's a joint model based so, on the transition system. So the yeah. difference is the algorithm? The main difference is the, yeah, the, yeah, the algorithm and also we use a few more features, like some high order features than the transition model. Because here we can define, you know. So the transition model uh, is the constraint on, on the form of the features. Right. You mentioned earlier. Right, right. right. Exactly. The Chinese data set, uh, do you have one baseline data or only, I'm not sure I understand the color code there. Uh, Oh, the color here just want to say there these are two different systems. They are different uh, oh. they are different systems. This one is a pipeline model, uh, which is uh, the one in the shared task, and this one is a transition based model, a joint model. Okay. Yeah, that also jointly do the signal transfer tagging and parsing. Okay. So that is why the why the difference here is much smaller. Yeah, yeah I was confused by the, the orange line there. I thought yeah, yeah, they sorry. Made something. I, yeah, that is some, um, you know, okay. a slight trick. I didn't, <laughs> yeah, small mistakes here. Do you have so. any idea what's the pipeline model for, for, for Chinese? <coughs> uh, yes, I can't remember the exact number, but uh, I think if you go back to this paper, they definitely have the results. But I, I think the difference is about like 70, uh, 7, 78 percent uh, dependency F score if you use the pipeline model here. Okay, so here shows the TED eval score on the SPMRL data set. So this score provides a joint evaluation on the quality of segmentation and parsing. And we improved the score by about 2.2 percent, uh, corresponding to a 27 percent error reduction on this data set. Okay, so in the second experiment, we analyzed the impact of joint prediction by comparing against the pipeline variant of our model. So just to remind you, we use the same pre-processing system for both pipeline and joint models. Here shows the example comparisons on parse speech tagging F-score. So we can see that joint prediction improves over the pipeline model on all three data sets. And the gain is about one to two percent. And specifically, the error reduction on the SPMRL data set is about 40%. And we also observe a similar improvement pattern on segmentation and dependency parsing. We further break this improvement based on in vocabulary and out of vocabulary words. And we also use parse switch tagging as the example here. So we can clearly see that uh, the OV words consistently benefit more from joint prediction and the difference are particularly significant on the mixed Arabic data set. Because as I mentioned, the mixed Arabic data set, uh, the classical Arabic uses, uses a different vocabulary from MSA. Okay. So in this slide, we show the impact of the number of analyses that we used in the model. So remember that for Arabic, we use the MADA system to predict top K candidate morphological analysis and then combine them into the lattice structure. So here the x-axis is the k-value, that is the number of analysis we used. And the y-axis is the score for each evaluation metric. The leftmost point, x equals to 1, corresponds to the accuracy of the pipeline model. So first we can see that imp uh, including more analysis uh, in the lattice will improve the performance on all the evaluation metrics. And second, the learning curve converges at about 20 analysis here. Okay, so we have seen from the empirical results that uh, this randomized greedy method works well for joint prediction. 
In this analysis, we want to show some comparisons between the joint inference and the inference for dependency parsing. Specifically, we show the comparisons of the convergence property. Let's first look at the case in dependency parsing. The figure here shows the number of random restarts we need to find the optimal solution. And we use the maximum score in 3,000 random restarts to approximate uh, the maximum solution, uh, to approximate the optimal solution. The x-axis is the number of restarts and the y-axis is the normalized score based on the uh, optimal solution. So we can see that for most of the sentences, it, the algorithm converges to the optimal solution in the first 50 random restarts. And here the blue line shows the uh, convergence of the joint model. As expected, the convergence of the joint model is slower than the uh, parsing model because joint inference is more difficult. However, both curves still look remarkably each, uh, similar to each other. Like for most sentences, the algorithm converges to the optimal solution in the first, in the first 50 random restarts. Okay, so here I, I have completed the first part. In summary, uh, in conclusion, we show that the simple randomized greedy algorithm also works well for the hard uh, pre joint prediction task. And on both Arabic and Chinese, our model outperforms the state-of-the-art system and the pipeline variant of our model. Okay, so now we have the randomized greedy algorithm that can handle arbitrary scoring function. However, the efficiency of this uh, algorithm is still an issue. This is because there is a trade-off between the number of random restarts and the performance. So generally speaking, given more random restarts, we can get a better performance, but at the cost of more training and testing time. And it's usually an empirical question to find a suitable number of random restarts uh, for, the, uh, for each task. In our case, we need around 15 hours to train with 15,000 sentences. Uh, but in some cases, uh, the time cost can be much higher than the pipeline model. So the question here is, can we still reduce error propagation from predicted text, but also keep the inference complexity the same as the pipeline model? And the answer is yes. So in the next part, I'm going to introduce how we achieve this goal. Okay, so in this part, I will talk about our stack propagation method for joint parsing and tagging. And as I just mentioned, the key feature of this method is that the inference complexity is the same as a greedy uh, transition-based parser that is linear to the length of the sentence. Okay, so this method is developed based on a transition uh, system for dependency parsing. So I'm going to first very briefly introduce, uh, explain this transition system. So this system consists of a stack and a buffer and the pass tree is incrementally constructed from a sequence of actions. So there are three basic types of actions. First, the left arc action as a dependency from the top element to the second element. And second, the right, action, the re the right arc action as a dependency in the opposite order. And third, the shift action moves the first element in the buffer to the top of the stack. And the passing algorithm is to keep finding the next uh, action uh, given, the f given the current configuration and move to the next state. The learning objective is to find a good distribution over all possible actions to generate good post trees. So the key question here is how to model this distribution uh, over, actions, uh, over actions. So recent state-of-the-art parsers have been using a neural network to model these distributions. And our method also follows this framework. So here shows the basic unit of the model. First, the model extracts sparse features from words, labels, and uh, part speech tags and embeds them into vectors. Then the embedding vectors are fed into the hidden layer and softmax layer. And finally, the network outputs the distribution over all possible actions. So most previous work still uses a pipeline method to generate part speech features. They first train an independent part speech tagger and they use predicted tags as sparse features. And the features are represented as a one-hot uh, one feature vector. So in the context of neural network parsing, we also call this method stacking because it's like stacking, it's like stacking the parser on top of an independent part speech tagger. 
Here we call it traditional stacking method. OK, so as discussed earlier, the traditional stacking, that is the pipeline method, has several issues. I have already talked about the error propagation problem. And here I want to mention another related issue, that is the limitation of using discrete part of speech representation. This is because this representation, this discrete representation, will encode less information when we're using a coarse text set. For instance, when we use the fine text set that distinguish between numbers, the parser is able to learn that the plural noun, the plural noun should not be the subject of the singular verb. However, if we use the coarse text set that, that doesn't have the number information, uh, it's very hard for the parser to <laughs> learn this pattern. So if we use the universal text set that only has 12 tags, the parsing accuracy will drop by about 0.7% on the Wall Street Journal data set. And this is a remarkable amount of loss on this data set. So in order to address these issues, uh, here we propose the new stacking method that we call stack propagation. And the core idea is very simple. We just replace the discrete part speech features with hidden layer activations of the tagger. So the model, will learn, so the model learns continuous representations uh, as features for parsing. And we also embed those continuous features into vectors as other discrete features. So comparing to traditional stacking, our method has the following advantages. First, it is more robust to parse speech errors, that is the error <coughs> propagation. Uh, because, this is because the parser doesn't rely on the predicted text during the inference. So the tagging errors do not directly have a negative impact on the parsing decisions. Second, uh, we will show that this the inference complexity of this method is the same as the greedy uh, parsing model, uh, that is the pipeline model. And finally, we argue that the feature representation, our feature representations are better than traditional discrete features. This is because when, by using the hidden layer activations as features, we are free to choose the size of the feature vectors. So the vectors can encode richer information than the traditional feature vectors. OK, so in our experiment, we show that our model outperforms the previous LSTM model by 2.7% on the universal dependency tree bank. So next, let's take a brief overview of the network architecture of our model and comparing it against the uh, traditional stacking network. So in tr we can see that in traditional stacking, the parser and the tagger network are typically independent to each other. So the training signal of parsing will not uh, backpropagate into the tagger network. However, in our model, the, uh, the training signal of parsing also backpropagates into the tagger network because the hidden layer of the tagger is shared by the parser, and we are jointly training both networks at the same time. So the tagger network takes information from both the parsing and tagging training examples. So from this figure, uh, the structure here looks similar to the multitask network. But later, I will show that our model actually has a more complex structure. So our model consists of two main components one for parsing and one for tagging. For the tagger network, we use a standard window-based neural network classifier and extract features from words, suffixes, prefix, and so on. As mentioned earlier, we use hidden layer activations as continuous features for parsing. And specifically, uh, we use the rectify linear unit as the activation function. Our parser network is based on a standard a uh, transition-based neural network parser with two main changes. We have already discussed the first change, which is to stack the parser on top of the tagger's hidden layer activations. And second, uh, we note that both the tagger and the parser networks have to learn parameters for word embeddings, and they are trained to capture similar syntactic patterns. So we can actually share the word embedding parameters across the two networks. Mm. So to this end, we simply remove all the features in the parser and only extract lexical features from the hidden layer activations. So in practice, this change reduces model parameters by about a half, while also keeps the parsing performance. So we significantly in 
increase the parsing speed and also save the memory. So while the architecture here looks still simple, uh, it, it will actually become more complex after we unroll the parser transitions. And the connections between the parser and the tagger will also become more, complex, more complicated than what we see here. And in the next few slides, I will show you the example on how it works. So here is the example of the unrolled architecture. Uh, first, we apply the tagger network on each token of the sentence and compute the hidden layer activations. Next, we consider the initial configuration of the transition system. Here, i is on the top of the stack, and 8 is at the head of the buffer. The parser takes activations from three different locations. First, the parser takes the activation from stack 0, which means the first element in the stack. And in this configuration, the token at stack 0 is i. So, we, so the parser first takes activations from the token i. Then the parser looks for the activation from stack 1, which means the second element in the stack. However, now the stack only contains one element. As a result, the parser takes in a zero vector as the second activation. For the third activation, the token at the buffer 0 uh, is 8. So the parser takes the activation from the token 8. Note that here we only show three activations for simplicity, but in practice, the parser looks up activations from 20 different locations. And another interesting fact to note here is that we don't need to predict parse switch tags during the inference. Instead, we only need to compute the hidden layer activations. OK, so now the parser takes all the inputs and predict the action and move to the next configuration. We repeat this process until the transition system constructs the full parse tree. Here shows part of the construction procedure and the connections between the parser and the tagger. And if we compare this inference procedure to the inference in a pipeline model, we can see that the only difference is, to, is that we use the hidden layer activations as features rather than the predicted parse switch tags. All the rest part of the procedure are the same. As a result, our pro stack propagation model actually has the same inference complexity as uh, that in the traditional stacking or the pipeline model. So far, I have introduced the inference algorithm. Now let's look at how we train the model. So the learning objective is to maximize the data log likelihood for both parsing and tagging. And we use the multitask style learning algorithm to solve this objective. Specifically, we first pre-train the tagger for one epoch and then we randomly alternate between the updates with parsing or tagging examples. So each time we sample from a Bernoulli distribution and to, to decide which task to update. An interesting observation here is that the first pre-train step is very important. It leads to a better performance and also faster conversion speed. So when training with the tagging examples, we simply update the whole tagger using normal backpropagation. When training with the parsing examples, we update the whole parser and the tagger except for the softmax layer. And then next, I'm going to show you some more details of learning with the example uh, of the unrolled architecture. So here, the tagger network receives training signal from the tagging examples and just updates the parameters of all the layers using normal backpropagation. And then the parser network receives training signal from <coughs> a parsing example. It first backpropagates the loss through all the layers of the network, like the standard backpropagation. Then it further backpropagates the, the, loss, the loss through the stacking architecture and into the tagger network. This is feasible because the subgradient of the activation function exists. So we call this process backpropagation. Moreover, the tagger softmax layer is not updated in this case because we are stacking the parser on the tagger's hidden layer. Okay, so for other learning details, we borrow the recipes from previous work. So I only list some important points here. So specifically, we use average stochastic gradient descent with momentum, and we use 1,024 hidden units for parser and 128 for tagger. We choose 64 as the embedding dimension for the, uh, for the hidden layer activations. Okay, 
So now let's look at our experiment and result. We evaluate our method on two data sets. The first one is the universal dependency tree bank. We choose 19 languages that has the, high, that has the largest training data size. And we use the universal tags for this data set. The second data set is the Wall Street Journal uh, from the pantry bank. And we convert the original constituency tree to dependency using the Stanford converter. For the transition system, we use ARC standard with greedy decoding for all languages except for Dutch. Dutch is a highly non-projective language, so we add a swap action in the transition system uh, to in order to generate non-projective trees. Uh, so we, in our experiment, we don't use the pre-trained embeddings to initialize the model for the universal dependency tree bank because not every language has a large corpora to train word embeddings. And for Wall Street Journal data set, we use the pre-trained word embeddings as in previous work. So we only use a greedy decoding in our work. So we first uh, focused on the comparisons against the previous transition-based neural network system that, uh, that, has, that used greedy decoding. Specifically, we compare against two LSTM models, a word-based LSTM and a character-based LSTM. We also compare against a joint parsing and tagging system that uses, uh, predicted, that uses predicted parse speech tags. So in addition to transition systems, we also compare against the RBG parser, which is a state-of-the-art graph-based parser. Actually, this parser uses the uh, randomized greedy algorithm for parsing that I just described in the first part of the talk. So first, let's look at the results on universal dependency tree bank. Here shows the average label attachment score on 19 languages. We first compare between our system and the greedy decoding baseline, that is the character-based LSTM. We can see that our stack propagation model significantly outperforms this baseline by 2.7%. Then we compare against a non-greedy approach, that is the RBG parser. And we can see that our greedy, our greedy model even outperforms this non-greedy parser by 1.3%. So here we also evaluate our model without using any part speech training examples. So the performance will definitely decrease in this case, but it's a, it's a bit surprising that we still achieve 77.3% in this case, which is only 1.3% lower than our full model. So without those you have the pre-training part. Uh, so the pre-training part is also, uh, we also don't do the pre-training in this uh, specific scenario. So it's the, yeah, it's the network that only has, that only use the part speech information. It has the part speech, it has, it has the tagger network, but you don't have any information from the softmax layer. The softmax layer is like nothing there. So you only extract features from like the different features and the hidden layer. Okay. So next we compare to a joint modeling baseline. The, this baseline achieves joint modeling with two extensions on the transition system. One is to expand the shift action with part switch tags, and the other is to replace the one hot part switch feature vector with a top K vector. So these results show that uh, our stack structure is better than traditional joint modeling, and our learned representations are also better than discrete feature vectors. Now let's look at some results on Wall Street Journal dataset. Here shows the comparisons between the greedy models, uh, that is the beam size equals to one. The first baseline is the LSTM model, and the second one is the joint model. And we can see that our model outperforms both baselines by about 0.3%. And for reference, we also include the best numbers from previous non-greedy approaches, which use uh, larger beam size and also deeper models. And the performance gap is about 0.8%. So we can see that uh, our greedy model still has a, a is still lower than the like, best performing system. Okay, here we also anal analyze the impact of the size of text set to the parsing performance of different models. Here shows the example on the Wall Street Journal dataset. When using the, the fine text set that has 
45 tags, our model improves the baseline by about 0.3%. However, when using the universal tag set with 12 tags, uh, the accuracy of the baseline drops by 0.7%. But our model's accuracy is almost the same as using the fine text set. So in this case, we improve over the baseline by 0.8%. And this means our model can achieve more gains when using the cross text set. So here we show a case study on how our model is robust to error propagations. The first tree is generated by a pipeline model. So the tagger makes a mistake on the token back, which should be a verb rather than an adverb. As a result, the parser predicts a totally incorrect parse tree because the adverb is, rare, is rarely the root of the sentence. However, our stack propagation model is able to address this issue because it doesn't rely on the predicted tags. So we can see that in this figure, the tagger still makes a wrong prediction on the token back, but our parser is able to predict the correct tree by using the hidden layer activations as features. So across the 19 languages uh, in, in the tree bank, we observed that our model achieves a 10.9% LAS gain on the tokens where the parse speech tagger make a mistake. And this gain is much larger than the rest part of the corpora. So finally, we, I'm going to show a few interesting examples based on the nearest neighbors of tagger's hidden layer activations. So in the first example, we compute the activations for the token judge. And we found that uh, its nearest neighbors all have the same pattern, that is a noun. And in the second example, all the activations capture the pattern of a verb that ends with ed. The interesting thing here is that we are actually using the universal text set that doesn't distinguish verb tense. So the post switch tag doesn't have this ed information. So we can see that the learned representations encode not only the parse speech tag information, but also the, some other syntactic patterns. OK, so that's all about the second part. In this part, we present a stack propagation model that reduces the error propagation while also has the same inference complexity as the previous greedy parsers. Regarding the performance, our model outperforms all baselines on the universal dependency tree bank and outperforms other greedy models on the Wall Street Journal. OK, so to conclude my talk, I would like to briefly show some potential future opportunities to apply the idea in this work to other NLP ap applications. For the randomized greedy algorithm, uh, we can apply it to different joint inference problems where the high order features or global constraints are useful. For instance, in information extraction, the global constraints may improve the consistency of uh, predictions across different, across different uh, documents. And in a dialogue system, the global features may be useful to identify the coreference between different sentences. And for the stack propagation idea, one possible direction is to jointly model parsing with other tasks, such as name entity recognition and morphology. And similar to what we did in post speech tagging, we can learn a joint representation for all tasks. And it will be interesting to see how much uh, error propagation we can reduce by using the new stacking structure. And that's all of the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to ask questions. Oh, okay. Question. Hold on. Um, in, in one of the earlier slides, you mentioned that uh, in one of the uh, components of your solution, you used a uh, passive uh, pass aggressive yeah, uh, right. algorithm. Is there a reason to, uh, why did you use that? Mm, well, uh, I guess there's no specific uh, reason for use that specific algorithm. It's because in the previous dependency parsing work, we also used this passive aggressive uh, learning framework, and it gives a good performance. So in the following up work, we want to use the same because we have more like su successful experience on using that. Yeah. Right. Um, especially for the dialogue systems, okay. um, we've done a lot of uh, studies to ex like use the best parses. And uh, the ones that are trained on Wall Street Journal or you know, yeah. they don't really work well on mm -hmm. dialogue systems. Yeah, right. 
so can you elaborate on how your like the joint inference mm -hmm. might be helpful, or maybe you know okay. other feature of uh, current research or okay. adaptation? Maybe? Okay. Okay. So the challenge here is a bit different from joint inference modeling because I think when you apply the uh, the Wall Street Journal parser to the dialogue domain is a like, domain adaptation problem. And one main reason is the out of vocabulary words. Maybe in the dialogue system you have a lot of OV words. And um, actually one possibility here is to use the stack propagation model because if you notice you can actually use different set of training corpus for parse speech text and the dependency parsing. So if you actually have a parse speech text corpus for the dialogue domain, and you can actually achieve a good tagging performance on this domain. Yeah, yeah, that may be like, you may be able to achieve a better performance on the, you know, uh, on the uh, dialogue domain using the parsing. Because uh, presumably uh, the syntactic grammars between the dialogue domain and the news domain should be similar because they are all English, right? A lot of grammatical uh, short sentences, you know, the, not every part of, like, the part yeah. of speech targets also. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that is some more challenging, yeah, task. Yeah, if there are some, like, more syntactic grammar difference yes. between the, you know, these two domains, then I guess some other things. Do you know of any current work that's been done? Uh, there are definitely, yeah, exactly. So there are definitely a lot of work on the Twitter research like the parsing for Twitter or parse speech tagging yeah. on Twitter. Uh, so uh, I'm not really sure about like the details of those work, but I think like the embedding, like the hidden representation or the embedding method should play an important role on this uh, adaptation method here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But in our work, we do not use any parser. <laughs> That's a good one. Huh? Who? In our work. Our work, we're not using. Yeah. We did use, we tried to. to you tried, right? Yes. But that's for sure. You tried for what? To try the process for, for, for the. In, in for the dynamics. Yes. For, for the layer part. Yeah. You think to see for particular reason? So just. Uh, the dependency parts is not work. The part of speech taggers, yes, they, they're okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have to be retrained on the dialogue corpus. Yeah, I think there are also a lot of researches on like part speech tagging task for the domain adaptation. Yeah. Right. Uh, like I think the key idea is to to use the embedding. Like you have the large corpora to train the embeddings for all the words. And the embedding somehow help you to achieve the transfer from different domains. Or Reddit or some other dialogs, but yeah. chatbots. So, right. So, assume that you have like large row code, you have millions of tweets, billions of tweets, right? Mm -hmm. So you can just train the embedding by combining this Twitter text with the, maybe the news text, like all the text together, and then you can just learn a joint embedding for all the vocabulary, and yeah. So that is based on the word embedding, and there are also some works based on the feature embedding. So it's one step further to the word embedding. So instead of so, in addition to learning uh, embedding for the words, you also learning embedding for the features like the suffixes, prefixes. Uh, but also based on a similar motivation, the context motivation when you learn the word embeddings, and when you learn the feature embeddings, such that the similar features share the similar word embeddings, then you can also apply your model directly from the source domain to the target domain because well, the features. Yeah. In the co-reference problems, you usually right. not test in dialogue systems. No, right? It doesn't. Yeah. The co-reference problem is a separate problem. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.